comrades move into residential areas and we take what's ours. Well, that's a quite a note there. Um, that was uh, from your first uh, episode this week, Victimhood Conspiracy. We don't know if that's true, by the way. We don't know if that's if, if that was a real uh, Antifa thing or somebody faking to be Antifa thing. That's one of the interesting things about Antifa. You never know what's real. Well, it, it's interesting because I talk to people who argue about what is or isn't Antifa, uh, which is how I say it, and and uh, and it's since it's not an organized group, so to speak, it doesn't have letterhead and a you know board of advisors and so on. Um, in essence, it is whoever is out there saying we're Antifa. And, uh, and so I, I look at it and say, well, this is, you know, this is how it gets defined. If someone wants to jump out and say they are Antifa, then, then we can, uh, you know, we, they can be interviewed and we'll read the article. But it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that, that in all of, all of what's going on right now, here is something that I think everybody would agree uh, should not be, you know, uh, anybody who has a platform, you don't want to have a platform where people encourage folks to go hurt people, steal their stuff, wreck their stuff, um, you know, vandalize property, so on and so on. Um, and, and, you know, there wasn't much controversy there, but I think that, in, in essence, um, you know, there's, there's a real argument out there between folks, uh, conservatives, and I think a lot of libertarians, and others more uh, on the left, and, and uh, people who might call themselves moderates and, and believe that the Washington Post and the New York Times is moderate as well. Uh, there's a real disagreement about whether there's bias in the media, which I think is, is, you know, I think it's laughable to even discuss it or even to, to discuss really where that essential bias is. It's a, uh, a, a very left pro government establishment bias. Uh, and so, so I think sometimes people on the left will look at the establishment part of it and try to say, well, oh, no, the media is somehow conservative. It's establishment. It's not left. But as we've discussed many times in these podcasts, uh, I, I think that the major media outlets I'm talking about, uh, Washington Post, New York Times, Associated Press, NBC, ABC, CBS, uh, CNN, are to the left – of the center of the Democratic Party in the United States, and and maybe to the left of the left side of the Democratic Party uh, sometimes, and so, uh, but but even libertarians, I think sometimes will argue. You don't hear many conservatives uh, talk about not seeing a bias in the media, but I think sometimes libertarians will. And and here, we really picked up in victimhood conspiracy, we picked up on a Reason article written by Elizabeth Nolan Brown, where she, I think, um, rejecting Trump's, you know, attacks on Twitter and Facebook and social media, you know, as being very, very uh, left and anti-conservative and anti-Trump. And she basically said, you know, this is a... a victimhood conspiracy. There's no real victimization here. And one of the things she pointed out is that there have been people who've been deplatformed, who've been, you know, harassed by Twitter and Facebook and so on, who are not conservatives. And that's true. Of course they have. Um, but what that proves, in essence, is that Facebook and Twitter and these other social media platforms have often behaved badly. And the fact that they behave badly to people who are on the left doesn't mean that they don't have a bias on the left and aren't behaving much worse to people who are on the right or the conservative side. And, <clears throat> you know, I think it, it to me, it, it, I hearken back to uh, 
of course, major media in this country doesn't call it a scandal, but the IRS scandal, where the nonprofit uh, center of you know dealing with nonprofit uh, IRS issues, uh, groups like mine, Liberty Initiative Fund, or Citizens in Charge, or National Rifle Association, or MoveOn.org, or any of these different organizations, there was a push where people were forming, the Tea Party groups more and more were forming, and there was an effort to block them from forming. It was political. I think early on there were some people who suggested it went all the way to Obama. I never saw any evidence of that. I thought it was stupid to ever mention anything like that. If you have evidence, you have evidence. If you don't, <clears throat> why create some ridiculous conspiracy theory? But it clearly went on. And while it's true that there were other groups on the left, in this middle, wherever, who also received bad treatment uh, and blocking, uh, you know, in a, in a free country where you have a First Amendment right to organize and assemble and agitate and speak out, and there is a system by which <clears throat> you can get nonprofit status because you're not trying to earn money. You're trying to convey a message. And the government actively tries to block people of a certain viewpoint, like Tea Party people. That is an incredibly serious, serious violation of our rights. It is the same sort of thing from a political standpoint, not from maybe the personal comfort standpoint, but it's the same sort of thing as Egypt arresting a blogger who's written some blog posts that they don't like because he's criticized the government. Now, he's going to be in a more uncomfortable jail. You just can't start your group. But both of them are at the very heart of political freedom and the ability to speak out to connect with other people, to decide issues as citizens. It is a, an attack on citizen control of government. And sadly, we expect it in Egypt. And unfortunately, we don't often expect it in the United States, and sometimes we get it. So that was a, that, that's a serious, serious problem. And of course, it went both ways, but not 50-50. It went both ways, maybe 95-5. And I think that, that the bias that these social media organizations have, it wouldn't be okay if the, uh, if the bias was flipped. That's not, uh, you know, that wouldn't be, I'd still be talking about it. Um, because, and, and not because, you know, they have a right to their bias. They have a right under certain laws. Now, that's part of the, the question is whether they haven't gotten special, uh, you know, uh, permission from Congress to do certain things as a social media platform that other folks are not allowed to do. But in, in, in just pure forms, they can do what they want to do. Uh, we, Congress should make sure that they get no special benefits um, and that nobody does. We, let's stop all the special benefits and let's have rules for everybody that are fair. But, but anyway, this, it, 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 to me, I think what's going on in our world today uh, from China that we'll get to later uh, that seems to want to bully speakers that aren't even in their country uh, a half a world away uh, and hates free speech uh, to a, a Western world where social media platforms seem to want to police speech in ways that we just are not used to having our speech policed. Um, and, and as we've said many times, and then I'll, I'll leave this, uh, freedom of speech is at the zenith of all of our freedoms. It is the thing that America has, has it's the gift we've given the world, and we ought to stand behind it. The rest of the world would sure like to have it. Um, and, um, you know, that's the thing that I think uh, we think about government and private sector and where the laws are and so on and so on. But I think at a base level in society, 
there are those who believe that we need experts and leaders from on high to tell us what's right and everybody has to then agree and we march as one and then there is what has kind of been called the free world where people debate and discuss and have different ideas and vote and and people decide and people can change their mind and and that is the world i want to live in and frankly it's uh, there's not a lot of immigration from the free world to the unfree world almost all the immigration is going the other way but we hear week in week out about people in public life average citizens the media talking about information and talking about speech and its freedom or lack thereof without any real respect for how important it is that we continue to be uh, a place of robust debate and disagreement and that we respect that and cherish that and not try to stomp on it to win some political argument. Right now, we should take a moment and remind everybody, you're Paul Jacob. My name is Timothy Vericola. This is This Week at Common Sense, and you are talking about the big stories of the week that appeared on your site, thisiscommonsense.org. We're here at the beginning of the piece. Now we're just one uh, segment in, and I thought maybe we should do it before we get to the end, and I introduce the podcast. I like it. We're terrible about reminding, so that's good. It's good that we do that. You know, hopefully there won't be any backlash, qualified or, or other, because our second uh, uh, commentary of the week was qualified backlash. And it was actually a study that, that you turned me on to, a piece by uh, Eric Dolan in uh, SciPost. And it was a study looking at how people react to violence and protest um, and how they react to protest uh, more broadly and so on. And, and trying to ascertain what impact does it have when, when there are riots, when buildings are burned, when there's violence and destruction? And it's not really all that surprising. But people don't like the violence and destruction. They lose the idea that they should be sympathetic with the underlying cause. And, uh, and I su suspect, it, this study didn't necessarily say this, but I suspect they lose any connection with what the underlying cause is. Because the underlying cause is rarely as horrific as flames and sirens and, you know, and, and here, of course, it is pretty horrific because it's a man being mm -hmm. murdered, in essence, uh, by a policeman who, you know, best case scenario, should not be on the police force and doesn't understand life and death and, and how bodies work and so on. And worst case scenario, killed someone by being incredibly cruel. Uh, whatever it is, it's, it's not good. And of course, it has led to this whole conflagration where, you know, you, you've got the, the country rioting and burning. And then, of course, most of the country's not rioting and burning, but large uh, parts of it are. And it seems to me it, it's funny in the sense that I certain, certainly I like protests. I recognize the importance of protests. We'll get to Hong Kong later, but that you know, there's been some property destruction in Hong Kong, uh, and I don't, I don't look at that and say this is terrible. Uh, although there are some things that have been alleged, I'm not sure they actually took place there. That I do think went too far, and I think looting and burning things down, and and I think generally property destruction is a stupid thing to do beyond not really being your right. Uh, because that's not your property. But here we had an opportunity. There are times where you can see how that might create news media attention. You know, maybe you're a, a people that's being oppressed and, and literally, you know, being murdered and tortured by your government. You have a certain right to do something to get attention. But what this study says 
And what is so true in this case, what the study says is this might not be very smart. If you want to actually win the, the day and have a better world, violence and riots and looting is not the right smart course. But I think what, what's also true here is you have a fairly united America. There are some incidents, um, you know, you go back to Ferguson uh, and, the, the, you know, in the end, when they looked into that, it actually, you know, I, I don't exonerate might be too strong a word, but it certainly said the policeman was justified to do what he did. And they didn't file charges. And they and the even the feds outside of Ferguson came in, looked at it, said, don't file charges. There's no they aren't warranted. Um but in other cases, you know, it's, it, it's gone a lot of different ways. In this case, there is no real controversy that the, these policemen acted in the wrong, that the one policeman really, really was in the wrong, and that something needs to be done. And to me, the importance of, of seizing this moment is to unite people in doing something that makes it less likely to happen again. And so often we, we're going to have a conversation about race, which I think probably is a good idea. But it's not going to solve these problems because in conversations, you know, that won't change the dynamic on the street, I think, uh, anytime soon enough. What would change that dynamic, which is something that last week we, we uh, advocated and then mentioned again in Qualified Backlash, is ending qualified immunity for police officers and other government officials while we're, while we're at it. But don't allow police to somehow be immune to prosecution unless they acted in completely bizarre ways. If they act in unconstitutional, illegal ways, and if they kill someone without just cause, they need to face the music. And, and so much of what's happened, I think why we've had so many people die, not just black people, but a lot of black people, a lot of people of color, a lot of people of the color white have been killed by police. Police in this country have been militarized by our federal government, dumping all this military stuff on them. The drug war has created an excuse for them to be in everybody's business and to be criminalizing people who may have a problem but don't need to be criminalized. I mean, if, if, if you knew someone who had a drug problem, would you tell them to go down to the police station or would you send them <laughs> to a rehab or to a doctor or something? It's, it's ridiculous and it has, it's not just that it's been harmful for the people who get arrested and imprisoned on drugs. It is harmful for all of us because it, it has led to a slippage of our Fourth Amendment rights against illegal searches and seizures. It's led to all kinds of excuses for the police to have superpowers, civil, civil asset forfeiture, where they're stealing from people uh, who committed no crime, charged with no crime. Our criminal justice system is in shambles. And arguably, the, one of the best things that's come out of the Congress and, and working together with President Trump was the criminal justice reform bill that came out. More needs to be done, and we ought to be pushing that envelope instead of having this, let's tear the country apart, because as, as horrible as this killing is, I think it does bring us together because we all recognize this has got to stop. And, and so let's think of ways to stop it. Let's have discussions on TV about how we stop it. And we can have discussions about race, too. But the discussion about race is about changing people's attitudes. And that's not the same thing as changing the law. And I want to stop policemen from shooting people that shouldn't be shot whether I can change their minds or other people's minds, whether some old man in some place has some crazy idea, I, 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 want, I want to change his mind. Let's change the law and let's make sure that there are consequences. Um, because I think that the, you know, one of the things uh, that has surprised me pleasantly 
about the criminal justice issues from police cameras, uh, where they're you know they're all over the country now. They're they're the public support is 80s uh, in the in the high 80s. Uh, more support for police cameras and changing civil asset forfeiture than things like term limits, uh, which are pretty darn popular. So um, the American people are there on criminal justice reform. We just haven't been able to find the levers to push uh, to get it done. And uh, and this should be a time that the Congress and the White House come together and that people come together to say, let's do something about it. And instead, it's it's been let's rip things apart. Let's burn things. Let's loot. Um, and and that's not to say, hey, this isn't important. This is absolutely important. It's just how are you going to do something about it? In other words, the importance of this and the and the anger about all these people being killed, it's understandable that that would make people angry. It doesn't mean that the next thing to do is to release that anger by looting or rioting or smashing something. It may be understandable why someone just went crazy and did that. It doesn't make it right. And it and the bottom line of that um, of that study is it's a way not to get change. And if we want to stop people from being killed, we've got to get change. And that that requires us to use our noggins and and do the right thing, run the right campaigns, make the changes. No, no excuses. No, let's not run around blaming people. Let's get everybody together. We can get together and make these changes. I'm leery about protests. If the protests seem ineluctably turning into riots, if every time you protest in a certain way, it becomes a riot, I think that you're probably doing something wrong. Now, I'm not saying every... You are. Yeah. And I'm not saying that every time we have a, you know, a, a police protest riots happen, but it happens quite a few times. And so I think that should give people who are concerned about the issue uh, some pause. So I put up a thesis that says, continuing to, continuing to protest at this point is to enable and sanctify the rioters and looters who are evil. Therefore, anyone who protesting in the streets is complicit committing gross immorality. I just thought I'd lay it on thick. <laughs> That is thick. Evil may not. Uh, well, I think you're evil if you're if you're if you're, if you're doing violence yeah. in the street. If you're burning down buildings, burning yes, a church, that is, it, that's just yeah. evil. I thought it mentioned also that a few weeks ago. Uh, just to speak to that real quick, though, it's I would would hope that there is leadership behind some of these things that would find ways to prevent that sort of thing from happening. In other words, that you would have certain ground rules that would say, if anyone starts to destroy property, move away and call attention or something, you know, just different strategies that would say, we're not going to have our event hijacked by violence. We're not going to let it happen. Or think of different ways to do it. We're now going to go sit in at this place and we're all going to lay across the street or whatever it is it's hard for anyone to smash anything if they're laying on the ground. And if they're not laying on the ground and they're smashing something, they're not part of your effort. And, and the reason I, I look at it that way is because I can see being at this, I'm thinking about going to a, uh, a protest tomorrow because I want to go and carry a sign that says end qualified immunity. I want to get that concept out. I want to get my message out and there's, and I know, look, I've been to a, enough rallies to know that there's always some message I don't agree with that's getting out at that rally too. And so our protest or what, what have you. So you got to kind of take the good and the, in, and the bad, but it, 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 I think part of the problem is we are shown these by national media narrative companies. And uh, at least I think there's a big part of it. And so these, protests take on the this is the 
the man who's been put upon rising up. In other words, this is this is the beginning of of Marx's revolution or somebody's revolution that says, I've been oppressed long enough and I'm going to do something about it. And and that happens. That's happened in history. It'll happen again. But I don't think that that's what's happening here. And and I think we would all be more sympathetic if if that was what's happening here. I think what you have here is a lot of people coming together to protest what we all agree has got to stop. And that is horrific police behavior. The more you make this about, you know, that somehow the destruction has a cause that is connected to the policy issues that are being debated, um, the more you justify that destruction. And I think that a lot of people see this as, you know, a revolution against the man and oppression. And if you see it that way, then you're much more forgiving of bad behavior. You're tearing down the will. Well, the, like the uh, like the the tweet, um, they're taking back what's theirs. They're destroying what someone else got and stole from them. And I just think it's much much better to instead look at it and say, rather than it being part of all of human history, what's the problem? Can we solve it? Is there something that we can do to, to solve this problem? And then how do we implement that solution? And of course, you might say, well, we're so put upon that we've got to get enough attention and therefore we need mass protests. And maybe the, you can think of other reasons for having mass protests. But those protests have to, they have to move people's hearts and minds. And, and so that's, you, you've, you've got to, and, and I think that the more they're focused on solutions, the less they're likely to get hijacked by violence. Because if the solution is to end uh, qualified immunity or to get better rules for police cameras or to, or it's five of those things, or it's to go through a whole list of those things, spray painting the, the bus stop or smashing some store's window just doesn't seem at all related to that. If instead you're revolting against an evil society, well, then destroying things in that society almost kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And that's the, I think that's the difference in, in uh, attitude about it. And, and which one do you think it is? Is it a, are, are these people who are looting and, and uh, destroying property, is it because of our evil society uh, and they're just a, a voice in the wilderness trying to wake things up? Or are they full of it? and actually getting in the way of a lot of decent people who we might agree or disagree with, but decent people who are trying to do good things to make our, our society a better place. One of the lines in your piece mentioned the fact that uh, enemies of whatever the protests are, that is opponents of the, whatever their cause is, have been known and been caught in the past, the FBI in America, for instance, is an example, to have had bad actors in there pretending to be on the side, doing bad things to encourage others to do the bad things. And we know that some of that's gone on. We also know that Antifa has got in, into the act to some degree in many of these protests to turn them into riots. Yes. We don't know the extent because the reporting has been very bad. There's reason to believe cops have been involved, too, undercover cops that have been making things worse, and we have to wonder why. You know, I read the report, uh, Rights in Conflict was the name of the book form of it, but it was, I think, the Warren Commission. I might have that wrong. It was the commission that did the, the report on the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1968 and the riots and protests around it, and there were several incidents in that book that were documented one where they started to burn an american flag police moved in big riot ensued the person burning the american flag was an undercover undercover government agent and we see this again and again and it's it's not always government agents sometimes it's people on the other side who do things but uh 
That's why it is important to police your own activities politically. It's not always easy. It doesn't mean that if something happens, it's there. It's the leaders of the protest fault. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying, suggesting that you do want to police it and you do want to condemn it when bad things happen. And uh, and. I'll tell you, we need some sort of maybe new laws. I'm not big on new laws, but we need something that says it is a awfully serious crime if we find government undercover agents committing crimes and encouraging crimes so that peaceful protests are turned violent by the police. And it has happened and there's a lot of accusations that it is happening and has been happening very recently in these in these protests and riots and so on and so you know that's that's outrageous but again it's you know this is stuff that that you know the average person out there i don't think i don't think this is a left right thing the average person out there does not think as that study showed does not think that it makes sense to burn stuff and smash stuff. In, in essence, I think the way it's covered is much more sentimental toward it than the American public is. Speaking of uh, sentimental, one of our sentimental favorites is President Donald J. Trump. I mean, everybody, he's such a nice guy. Everybody <laughs> just, just wants to get close to him. You know, just way to go, guy. You're my type of <laughs> sweetie. Anyway, uh, our, our uh, Wednesday piece was called Trumping China? Question mark. After doing it, I thought this may be the most pro-Trump common sense commentary I have ever done. And I have congratulated him on different things like, you know, uh, appointing uh, Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. And I'm sure there have been some other things, nothing like jumps to mind. And I've criticized him as well. Uh, but I've, I've tended to cover more how he's being covered, uh, which is, I think, fascinating and, and not well. But in thinking about uh, and talking with some people in Taiwan and, and uh, in Asia about China and Trump, I was fascinated by the fact that they were socially, I don't know what the right word is, I don't know if it's socially or just temperament-wise, not, and, and politically, more to the left, not pro-Trump, a little bit off-put by Mr. Trump, and yet they like him. They like him because of his positions on China. And they like him because he took the call uh, from the president of Taiwan. Um, because he's done things. And and this piece doesn't go into it. We're, I'm going to do one next week. I've already started writing it. Uh, about some of the little things that, uh, that President Trump has sweated on the China relationship. And we've talked about this before, the, the postal rates that were subsidizing, making it cheaper for folks in China to send cheap trinkets and different things in the mail to people in the United States for less money than it would cost to send it across town in the United States. And so there was this huge subsidy to China and president after president, you know, bitches and moans about it but doesn't do anything about it. And Trump comes up and does something about it. These pension funds, federal pension funds are looking to invest in Chinese companies. Well, every, every company in China, if the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party decides tomorrow that we're taking over all your company and taking all your money, they do it. And so it's not like you're investing in some private Chinese company. This is investments in China. Do we want our pension fund, our pension funds? And, and look, if they're private, they get to do whatever they want. But if they're public, there's plenty of things to invest in in this world. Do we really want to be sending our money to help build China? 
to help you know make sure that those concentration camps where a million or two million Uyghurs are being held have really strong walls and a, a nice security system. So um, it's just interesting to see their take on uh, Donald Trump. And of course, this uh, this one YouTuber, uh, Dream Lucid, uh, the fellow's name is actually Christopher Raymond Hall. He's uh, he was uh, born in Britain. He actually was educated in the United States, he says. He, uh, I guess, came of age in Taiwan. He lived in Taiwan uh, for about a dozen years, also lived briefly in China, and, and does his YouTubing currently from London. Anyway, he had a long rant, about a nine-minute rant, uh, that was right on the, right on the mark as far as seeing how the West generally had placated and appeased China and bent over backwards to allow China to get in a position that's very dangerous for people in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, as we're seeing. And, um, and it, it, he also was very, very worried that the West was so divided and that the American media and that a lot of the elite opinion was so anti-Trump that if anything hit the fan, I mean, he he uh, announced in in writing something about this particular video that he's very worried about an attack on Taiwan, a military assault on the island that would kill millions of people, probably. Um, and I know other people there who are worried, and they have every every reason to be worried. And so his his big question was. Is the West so divided that to oppose Donald Trump, if something happened and Trump wanted to intervene in some way to send some help to Taiwan to move forces in that area, would they oppose it in knee jerk fashion because Donald Trump is a bad guy? And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. If anything should unite us, opposition. To totalitarian China and support for free and democratic Taiwan should unite the free world. Um, because he was also uh, Dream Lucid and other people are also talking about Europe. Europe has had uh, the same track record except worse in terms of letting China get away with murder. <laughs> and, I, and I actually mean murder. Um, and so you know, this is uh, I, I just thought it was fascinating um, because uh, although he's British, uh, um, you know, he spent a lot of time in Taiwan and was saying the same things that I've heard from so many people that I know in Taiwan. And then, of course, uh, the, the, the very next day, Tim, uh, is the 31st anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. You know, it's interesting because Tiananmen Square and, and Hong Kong, when Tiananmen Square happened, I never really thought about this before, but when it happened, of course, Britain hadn't handed over Hong Kong yet. And that came, you know, eight years later, which you, I, I kind of wonder, geez, uh, that might give you some pause to hand over Hong Kong. And not that, not that Britain came by Hong Kong, honestly, they didn't, uh, but... But uh, interestingly enough, and then, of course, as this anniversary comes upon us, um, here is China basically violating their agreement and moving into Hong Kong in a way that, of course, it's not quite the, quite the same. There aren't the tanks rolling in. There's not one guy with a, you know, a satchel uh, and books uh, standing in the way of the tanks. There aren't thousands of people dead yet, um, but there really is a uh, kind of a deja vu feeling in that 30 years after the Tiananmen Square massacre, China is stronger and more dangerous, more dangerous to their own people. And because they are both economically and militarily stronger, more dangerous to the rest of the world. Very few people realize how many different, you know, they, they, 
they recently sank a Vietnamese boat. Uh, they're building islands in the sea that is international territory, and they're claiming it. They're claiming Malaysian islands, uh, Vietnamese islands. They have had border skirmishes with India. They, what they've done in Tibet, what they're doing with the Uyghurs, what they've done with Falun Gong, the fact that now, you know, they no longer abort babies after you've had one in China, you can have two. But they're still telling people how many kids they can have. I mean, it's just this, this 30 years later, this society that is so dangerously totalitarian is stronger militarily and economically and my view is that the United States and the West generally is weaker. And, and not so much weaker, weaker in the sense that we have just put up with Chinese bad behavior and we don't seem to recognize it. I mean, I think that the wake up call last year when, you know, the NBA and different people are falling all over themselves, uh, you know, to, to placate China and, and, oh, we're so sorry that that you're trying to destroy people's freedom and squelch their rights, you know, that we bothered to mention that. And Bloomberg, you know, uh, coming out and basically saying, oh, they're, you know, or, or Biden saying they're fine people. And frankly, uh, Trump is he's trying to, you know, do a deal saying all these nice things about she. And uh, I mean, it's crap. The difference, though, to, to uh, just jump back quickly to the previous piece about trumping China is that behind the scenes, the Trump administration has done some things, some real things that people in that part of the world have noticed and moving to do things now uh, against what's happened in Hong Kong. It, it's all scary. You don't know, you know, what will what will happen in the end. Uh, you don't want to provoke war. You also don't want to appease tyranny. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing. I'll tell you, we, we, uh, I ended this too many Tiananmen's uh, piece by pointing out though, that there's a big difference, uh, or that, that basically here in the U S at the time that we have this Tiananmen square, uh, anniversary, we are clearing people from Lafayette Square. We're having all these protests and and a lot of pushback uh, on, you know, why did Trump and the and the uh, feds clear that Lafayette Square and was it for a photo op and should they have done that and 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 Trump's talking about bringing the military in, which to me not only just smacks of the type of society I don't want to I don't want to be in but also seems like so much overkill. It seems like theater to me. I mean, I know there has been a decent amount of destruction. Uh, I think you have to take these things seriously, but it just, it seems like overkill. But where I came back to on this is because there were some, there was a, a cartoon, there were a couple articles where people were comparing Tiananmen Square to what happened in Lafayette Park with, with them clearing the protesters out and the whole idea of, of you know Trump using the military to uh, you know end the protests or or the violence in the protests, I should say, and and you know protect Americans, which I do think is the right thing to do to end. I don't think you need to bring the military in, but I think you do have to protect property and people. That's that's kind of why we have police. That's why we have these things. But the difference between any comparison is really us in Tiananmen Square the government cracks down the people have no processes no ability to speak without being arrested no processes to speak out through no elections no initiative and referendum no petition drives no fundraising drives to run an ad that says hey we want freedom no nothing whereas in the US of A we have every ability if we can't get the Congress and Justin Amash has already introduced a bill on ending uh, uh, qualified immunity. Um, but if Congress doesn't do it, if the Senate doesn't go along, if the president doesn't sign it, we can go in every initiative state. We can go into city after city 
and we could pass it there by petitions, by lobbying the city council. I'm not saying that there aren't all kinds of fixes we need. Our, our processes for democratic control, citizen control of government, uh, as we bemoan all the time and try to, try to fix, um, they are not what they should be. We don't have near the leverage we ought to have on our government democratically. Um, but we do have a heck of a lot more than they have in China. And we, instead of us being ripped apart and looking domestically and on the world stage as if we are a country about to fall apart, we could solve some of our problems. We could help ourselves and we could send a message to the rest of the world that, you know what, you can protest. You can have a system that is robust, that debates, that disagrees, and then votes and moves ahead. And, um, you know, I, I have become something of a, of a uh, small D Democrat. Uh, I don't believe that because a majority votes for something, that something that's bad becomes good. It doesn't. If you violate somebody's rights through government and there's a big vote where everyone says it's okay, still not okay. But the whole history of mankind, it seems to me, has been looking for ways for the mass of us to protect ourselves and each other from those with power, with big guns, with big money. Not that I want to take away their money, just don't want anybody to have power over us. We want to be free. That whole thing has been tremendously helped by democratic processes. And we need more of them, not less. And one of the things to me that is most amazing about the CCP controlled China is that they are very active and clear in their opposition to democracy. So many thugs around the world will pretend to be Democrats for as long as they can because they're just doing whatever they can to wield power. China and the Chinese Communist Party seems to have almost a, a ideological commitment to there being this elite group that runs a society of one, 25 people and one leader for 1.4 billion uh, and hates the idea of democracy. That's why, you know, in 27 years, they can just roll into Hong Kong and they wouldn't have violated any, any part of their agreement with Britain. They could roll in and say, okay, there's no longer two systems. You're under our yoke completely. They cannot wait that 27 years because they cannot allow Hong Kong to show itself and to be a symbol of a more democratic place and a place that's trying to get even more democratic because it's very limited democracy there now. That's, uh, you know, it's a very interesting thing that's going on. And it, uh, I think it's, it's hugely important. Um, uh, it's fascinating. It's inspiring what uh, young people with very little chance of success, what they have been able to do and accomplish. And I think they've woken up a lot of the world. What, what happened with the uh, Sunflower Student Movement in 2014 in Taiwan that I think turned around a slow slide into a client state of the CCP, uh, followed by protests in Hong Kong and these protests the last year, the 2019 protests in Hong Kong, I think has, has woken up a lot of the world and, and may have, in the end, I hope, will have protected a lot of the world from China becoming a much bigger monster. And hopefully someday, by stopping China from becoming a bigger monster, it will overthrow uh, the CCP. And interestingly eno uh, enough, there's a story out today, and I did not think, I can't think of how to pronounce the guy's name, but he's a huge uh, soccer star. He's retired, but he came out today. He's, he's uh, connected with a Chinese billionaire who's on the outs with the uh, CCP. He's also connected with Steve Bannon. And he came out today or yesterday and said that 
the CCP should be overthrown. They need to start a new federation in China and that the CCP is a horrible, horrible government. Um, and it's interesting because in news reports, initially, he was attacked. And then, of course, they withdrew the attacks because they didn't want anyone to know that he had said what he had said. So the, the censorship at first was all to hit him and then to pull back and pretend nothing had happened. Um, but anyway, it's, it's uh, you know, China has gotten a lot richer. I think there is probably more support for that government than there was years ago, just because people's lives are better in that sense. But they are very, very, uh, I think, vulnerable economically at the same time. And I guarantee you, nobody expected in 1989, as we mentioned in this commentary, it was a huge surprise that all of a sudden there were these protests uh, in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Nobody saw that coming. And the students go out and protest. And then there are millions of everyday folks, white collar, blue collar, all over the Beijing and all over the country who support what they're doing. They don't get to communicate with each other for the most part, but when somebody stepped forward, they were met by millions. So, you know, at the same time, people people can see through the, the BS that comes from the government, just in the same way that, that we can see through our own government's BS. And um, and I think um, I think there is hope for for, you know, China someday being a free place. Um, that that's really the only way to end the threat. But part of that is for the United States to be an example to the world, to be a strong place. And the only way we're strong is by being free, by being free and having the that that intellectual freedom and that economic freedom to to, you know, help the rest of the world. A few weeks ago on your site, there was a quote from Yves Guillaume, who's a French economist that no one but me reads anymore. And, uh, and I, I love the quote because it, uh, we've been, you've been talking about tyranny in the last two pieces, but earlier it was about the kind of the anarchy on the streets. And, right. uh, and he, uh, he, he said this, we must not confound liberty with anarchy. Liberty is the reciprocal respect for personal rights according to certain fixed rules known by the name of law. Anarchy is the privilege of some and the spoliation of others, according to the caprices of arbitrary will, of the cunning, and of the violent, and the feebleness and lack of energy of the timorous. And that's his, that was his line. He, is, he had nothing to do with anarchy. And he, but, of course, he was talking about is that the anarchy of violent riots and of people at each other's throats. He wasn't talking about liberty. Liberty was something different. And I think that that difference between tyranny on one side you know, on one end of the spectrum and mass violence on the other in between is what we want. And we just have to figure out what that is better than we have right now, because obviously we have some problems. What I like about this quote in part is that he uses the terms liberty and anarchy as normal people would use them rather than as philosophical uh, anarchists or uh, you know, philosophers or many libertarians would use them according to, you know, basically a, a technical meaning. And for most people, right. anarchy does not mean, you know, peaceful living without a government, you know, without the state. It means, you know, without an archon. It's chaos. It's yeah, chaos for it's most chaos. people. And because what they imagine is kind of what's happening on the streets, is they imagine some people attacking others and getting away with it. Lots of people. I, I, had, a, I had a friend years ago uh, when we discussed terms like anarchy more uh, who said, this is anarchy. This is what came from anarchy. And, and I think, I think it's easy to kind of talk about different systems, communism, capitalism, what have you. But we're, we came from somewhere, we're going somewhere, and so much of it is not, we're never going to be on a shining city, in a shining city on a hill. We're always going to be trying to get better. And so it, it to me, so much of it 
is is to look where we are and practically how do we get to a better place and and when people talk about anarchy um it's it's the kind of thing where there's there's going to be it's not going to stay anarchy um there have been been uh people who have argued things like let's get rid of ice um and if you had a different uh you know the immigration folks if you had a different immigration system maybe you could there's other people who have argued radicals we should get rid of the police well there's always going to be defense and police and because whether those are public or private people want people want security and, um, and it just seems to me that that uh, they don't want anarchy. They want security and they do want freedom. And, uh, and I don't like to connect those words, um, partly because it, it, it's also, you know, it's pie in the sky stuff. It's that city on the hill stuff. Um, it's Plato and the shadows on the cave. We have to be very practical. Years ago, I, I wrote a piece uh, called um, uh, I Pledge Allegiance to My Refrigerator Warranty, uh, playing a game on the Pledge of Allegiance that I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. But I said I pledge allegiance to my refrigerator warranty and made the argument that Stop all the mystical stuff, the mystical crap. And we're not pledging allegiance to the Republic. The Republic, we created it. And we ought to treat the Constitution less as something we would pledge allegiance to. Because we're the sovereign. We don't do any pledging of allegiance. We are it. And treat it more like your refrigerator warranty. And look, right here it says that that this is what it is, and I expect a court of law to to enforce that contract. And that would be a much better sense of of what it's all about. So now I should say that I don't have anything. I have no complaints about that. And I think that the radicals in the libertarian movement, those who think of themselves as radicals and who like the name anarchy for their own system. Would most of them would agree? David Friedman and many of the people they're, they're talking about private law and they're talking about practical solutions using contracts, and so they have. I think that they're on your side. However, getting to that place where the state doesn't interfere in basic contracts of of uh, defense, that's going to be that's a bit that's a bit of a different situation. And what I liked about the Eve Gio quote was that he put the rules of law as important for liberty. And it's not about, and we don't want chaos. We don't want conflict, universal chaos. We don't want universal conflict. We want some ordering and everybody wants the security. I think that Yeo is right, that liberty is the middle ground between tyranny and anarchy. But how we, how we actually make that precise, well, that's open for a lot of debate. Peaceful debate, right. I think. Right. <laughs> and speaking of uh, no pie in the sky and uh, personal thoughts, which you just did a few moments ago on your Friday piece, uh, you had some personal thoughts uh, that uh, may not translate to uh, recitation here. It's something that's been going through my head uh, several weeks ago. Uh, my wife and I were traveling on the highway and witnessed a horrific accident literally right in front of us. And uh, the person in the accident passed away. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's, I, I don't want to tell the story here because it did take a little time and, and it's really not, uh, I think you, I think people will have a better time if they go to this is common sense.org thoughts in slow mo is the name of the piece, but it was about what that felt like and, and some thoughts off of that, but really came to the conclusion that living and dying, dying is part of life. Uh, it's my least favorite part of life, um, but it's important. And that one of the things that has troubled me for the last few months, and I've looked to to write something on it, and I just, it, you know, I haven't seen something to really comment on. I've, it's kind of been going through my head. Is 
early on with the coronavirus, the idea that it's so contagious and and you know people dying alone in the hospital and their family can't go and their spouse can't go because the hospital policies and and uh, so on say oh you know nobody can can be there and you know I, I realize I haven't done any deep studies of every hospital policy in the United States but I find that incredibly troubling the idea that people would be dying alone and I realized I was talking to a friend and um, I you know we got to talking about our wives and so on and we started out joking and then um, you know said look I, I just can't imagine uh, you know my wife being in the hospital or me being in the hospital and not being able to be there at the deathbed and um, and I think that that you know, life is important, but it's how we live it. And I would not want to, I don't want to go out of this world trying to gain a couple extra days or years and not living it the way I want to live it, which is to be there for my wife if she were passing away and she feels the same way. So um, that's something that I think our society has to take a look at and uh, and I think we have to start talking to our hospitals and and saying, look, uh, you know, this is this is important. This isn't just about life and death. It's about how we live and how we die. Well, on that cheery note, I think we've covered the week. I think we have two. You froze, so I was very afraid that we didn't get it and we'd have to do another take. So. I'm glad to know that it's it worked. Maybe I was just very, very still. You're still frozen or very, very still. Okay, well, it's, I've been accused of that recently, that I'm not emotional <laughs> enough online. I don't tell enough personal stories. I'm always being uh, marshalling an argument with evidence and not uh, being personal enough. Well, okay. I think that I can cop to that. Okay, very good. This has been uh, the first week of June for uh, 2020, and uh, we can talk uh, to... The, each other and the people next week <laughs> sounds great sir and uh, i'll talk at you soon okay bye